morning. Uh, happy to see many familiar faces and a collection of people I'm not so familiar with. Uh, I am. Uh, my name is Tokon. I'm a resident here at uh, Snow Mountain Zen Center. Um, I gave a student talk here uh, a year ago, and um, uh, that was basically, uh, you know, introduced myself to uh, the Zen Center and the community. Uh, so I'm going to kind of keep it brief here uh, this morning. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, after talking a little bit about who I am and whatnot, uh, give you an opportunity if, in case anybody um, does have any questions about uh, myself before I get into the main body of the talk. Um, but before all that, I kind of want to start with mentioning a little bit about the process that I've uh, gone through in the last couple of months uh, as I uh, was scheduled to give this talk. Um, and um, I began then uh, writing and reflecting and collecting uh, voluminously uh, um, whatever thoughts and feelings uh, were coming through. And with the hope that, you know, a couple months down the line by now, uh, I would have something uh, together and uh, ready to share with everyone here. Well, you know, <laughs> the best of plans and uh, the weeks passed, plenty of stuff accumulated. Uh, but finally last week, so then I decided to uh, collect all my um, little tidbits vast collection of, uh, of uh, pieces and try to come up with something to, to really share here cohesively. Um, but uh, I only came to discover that all those little pieces really were meant to be just little pieces uh, separate and they weren't coming together very cooperatively. Um, so then uh, actually it was just uh, yesterday that I started putting something together uh, hours before I was supposed to review it with my teacher. And uh, but something uh, just as that uh, final hour uh, started to uh, dawn, a little bit of light came through, a little bit of hope and um, inspiration. And uh, so uh, the sign that was on Roshi's uh, house uh, as I entered to um, share with him uh, what I'd come up with, uh, he had a little sign that says, uh, let it just happen, the beauty and the terror. And that pretty much sums up. Uh, where I'm at right now. <laughs> so it is wonderful to, to be here, uh, uh, spend this time uh, with everyone here, friends and unfamiliar. Um, let's see what I got. So uh, like I mentioned last year, I, I gave my uh, first ever student talk, uh, introducing myself. And today though, um, here I sit uh, as a student of the Buddha Dharma in the tradition of my teacher, Jokcho Kwang Roshi. I am resident here at the Zen Center. I've been here about uh, two years now. Um, I first met Roshi in 1990 when I came here about 35 years ago. Uh, not with the intent of being a resident here. Uh, I was just a visiting guest. Uh, but I was about 29 years old at the time. I had just uh, returned from a, a, a trip to India as a school project. And I was looking for something a little different than school. And um, as I was here for a few days, I soon recognized that uh, this wasn't a bad place to uh, settle down with for a while. And so I stayed here as a resident actually for about three and a half years uh, to um, see what all this stuff was about. After that three and a half years, I was feeling you know, a little unconfident about myself and what skills I had to contribute to the Zen Center here. So I left for about a year and a half uh, before returning then again as a resident. Um, and during that time, uh, so then I returned uh, for a second time. And uh, during that second stay here, I ended up meeting my future wife, um, only then to have to leave here again um, to raise my family with her. And so I've been gone uh, more or less for about 25 years. Uh, I'd come in and check in, but not a, a regular active practicing member here for that period of time. But uh, when I left all those years ago, I knew that I had some unfinished business here and that I would want to return um, when uh, my family uh, responsibilities were less demanding my time and attention. And uh, fortunately, 
my, uh, through the grace of my uh, very accepting and supportive wife, I've returned to be a resident here um, starting about two years ago. Um, uh, last year, uh, I ended up uh, receiving Tokido ordination. I was offered uh, Tokido ordination, which is um, taking on the Bodhisattva vows and, and receiving uh, these robes. Um, as a novice priest and the lineage of Bodhidharma, Hui Neng, which is the sixth patriarch, and uh, Ehei Dogen, Shogaku Shunryu, Suzuki Roshi, to name a few uh, ancestors in our lineage. Uh, I mention these names because uh, it has actually, uh, this inspires me with the realization that uh, these very real people, our ancestors, uh, through great effort and sacrifice in their own lives, are entirely responsible for keeping uh, the possibility open for this life, our lives, to engage in the Buddha way today and uh, making it available to others through our combined efforts, both lay and ordained here at Sonoma Mount Zen Center. Uh, briefly, so that's kind of the, my uh, introduction bio, uh, pretty ba uh, vague, so I'm happy to uh, open it up to any questions my friends or even unfamiliar people uh, may have of uh, myself here. here. So if not, we can just uh, proceed on with our talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mila. What was it, what was it like internally? Uh, to know that you had unfinished business here and then having the responsibility of raising the family and waiting all those 25 years? Or did you wait? Did you not know what it was going to happen? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, but uh, uh, internally, uh, my feeling was there was I really didn't have a choice. It was, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't the option at that time for me to raise my family here at the Zen Center, even really to be married. That we didn't, as residents, we didn't have that kind of a accommodation. Um, so it wasn't really that much of a choice. Uh, there were a few years. My wife was actually uh, had received Jukai here. Uh, she was a member here, a practicing member too. Um, so you know, for a few years, we uh, did what we could uh, to participate as much as possible with. Uh, the uh, activities here at the Zen Center, but uh, while living outside. Um, but when the kids came along, um, it was a bit uh, too much for uh, for us to handle uh, in and out, one foot in, one foot out kind of thing. And so the concentration, we, we um, put it into the family and taking care of the kids and providing for that. I still remained uh, involved here, uh, but very uh, incidentally, I'd come for some sittings or uh, help out with various work stuff uh, when called upon. Um, but uh, it, was, it wasn't even so much uh, unfinished business, maybe maybe that's not the best way to say it, but I felt like uh, it was just so compelling by that time for me to want to be in this way that, uh, you know, it wasn't really even an interruption. It was just a way of uh, bringing uh, practice into raising my family there and then uh, continuing on without interruption back here at Sensei. Uh, if it had been left to me, I probably would have waited until I, you know, kind of formally retired some years down the line. I actually came back kind of prematurely. <laughs> uh, but that's how my life goes. Unexpected things come along. And um, I answered. So uh, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. We're all good? Oh, yeah. Rika. So when I uh, have read your story and I have a question about you, what brought you to India and also you, I think you work with uh, the monastery with Mother Teresa. So what about that experience and also Mother Teresa is a Catholic Christian, so what about the transition from that kind of sure. religion to sure. Buddhism? Okay, uh, yeah, let's rewind the reel a little bit then. Uh, so uh, I grew up in the Bay Area down in San Jose, uh, graduated high school in 79, 
uh, immediately joined the Navy. I was in the Navy for about six years as a nuclear engineer. Uh, when I left the nuclear uh, engineering and Navy stuff, I was trying to think of what would be more uh, interesting than nuclear power stuff. And so uh, when I went off to college, I was doing a kind of a neuroscience program. And I did that uh, for a bit. I was in an honors program uh, in Cal State uh, system. And uh, part of that program, we were required to do a community service project. And uh, I was choosing to do, I wasn't religious or spiritual or anything at the time. Uh, but I wanted to help out uh, or potentially get a clinic started or something for migrants down in the Central Valley. And I thought it'd be great to get my picture taken with somebody like uh, so notable as Mother Teresa. Um, so it's pretty much a propaganda ploy. <laughs> uh, so off to India, I go for a summer. Uh, and uh, I didn't get a chance to meet Mother Teresa, but I went to Calcutta and, and worked at uh, Kaligat, which is her um, well-known place there, uh, you know, with the Sisters of Charity working for the poor. And I went out there in Calcutta um, one summer. And while there, uh, I ended up, I was there for, I, I was planning on being there for two months working with the, their, their group there. But I only ended up spending a month there uh, because I got frustrated with the sisters. You know, they were, I was just having, you know, kind of uh, disagreements, let's say, diplomatically, uh, with uh, how they were dealing with their, their clinic, their patients and whatnot. There's a lot of discrimination and things that were culturally difficult for me to um, uh, accept. And so I ended up uh, leaving the, uh, the, the the, the sisters there um, to continue on their way. And then I decided, well, I got a month left to be in India, so I'll travel around. So I traveled around and I, uh, but uh, a friend of mine had told me about this one place down in the south of India. Of course, when I was working with the sisters, uh, all my friends there were mostly Christians uh, coming to help from various parts of the world all over Europe and America and whatnot but they were all in the Christian tradition and whatnot. And they said, well, there's this guy down in the South of India that's uh, worth checking out. Um, it was very interesting. And he was a Benedictine monk himself, a uh, place uh, uh, running a monastery called uh, Shantivanam Ashram. So he was interesting because in part, uh, you know, it's, he's actually running a monastery, Catholic monastery, but it's called an ashram. <laughs> and he wore the saffron robes of, uh, the sannyasins of, of India, and uh, but he didn't he didn't look or sound or feel anything like uh, you know the Catholic stuff that I was familiar with or any of the Christian stuff. He was just very open, um, open-hearted, minded person. And he was a, a rather elderly at the time, maybe in his 80s. Anyways, um, watching the simplicity of their life there and how yeah uh, how simple it could be, just really uh, left a big impression on me. And I said, wow. Uh, this is nothing I ever uh, thought was even possible in the modern era uh, to live so simply and integrated with the, the local people. Um, <clears throat> and so openly, uh, you know, just you know, non, so unconditionally accepting. Uh -huh. And uh, so that's when I, right then and there, I said, I've got to, uh, I got to stop this public education, you know, college thing and take some time out. So as soon as I came back to the States, uh, that's what I did. I left uh, college because uh, I was in an honors program. I uh, gave them uh, a semester to wrap up for me to wrap it up with them. Uh, but then I left in the middle of the winter, some, I forget, uh, 88, 89, something like that. And uh, I went to look for what I found there in India, here in America. So I was traveling around actually wanting to become a Benedictine monk. Uh, so I was visiting monasteries here uh, down in the Southwest and along the West Coast because uh, I like it here. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't finding anything like that either uh, in those mm -hmm. places. So I was still just wandering around and, and I actually, uh, but I was hitchhiking back in those days, you could get away with it. Um, and, uh, and then just, you know, camping out along the way, wherever. But I ended up uh, visiting a place in Ojai um, that and it was actually uh, a Thich Nhat Hanh group. Uh, but Joan Halifax, a uh, well-known sort of Zen teacher, uh, was in residence there at the time. And uh, she and I got a chance to, to spend a little e evening you know, over tea um, talking about, you know, uh, my journey 
mostly about me. Uh, and uh, she happened to uh, mention that of all the Zen teachers in America, you know, this guy at Sonoma Mount Zen Center, Jokshu Kwang Roshi, was the best of them. And just if I, you know, became disillusioned with the Catholic thing, that if I, you know, were to give the Buddhist thing a shot, you know, this would be the place to go. And uh, and as I was continuing on with my travels uh, and the Benedictine monastery things weren't working out as expected. Uh, I said, well, I'm not coming, I'm coming along not far from uh, this place in Sonoma. I'll uh, give it a check out, um, you know, spend a couple days here or something. And so I came here with just that intent, a few days. And uh, I don't know exactly what it was, uh, but it was just, again, that something very uh, attractive about the simplicity of the life that was here and the purity, sincerity of the efforts, uh, the people who were here at that time, 35 years ago. Uh, spoke to me enough to say, yeah, I can settle down here and just look into it, spend a year uh, to see what's going on. Maybe I'll find something while. So that's what got me um, actually to, to dip my toe in the water, so to speak. Uh, is that? Yeah. Toka, can you uh, say something about um than your motivation that brought you here the first time, 35 years ago, and your motivation to be here in practice now. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's been, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a lot of changes along the way, hopefully, you know, 35 years. Didn't just squander it. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, just like everyone, um, I was looking for something outside of myself, even, you know. Um, didn't know what it was exactly, but uh, you know, I was trying to answer that call. And um, you know, over the years, uh, I don't know when exactly, but somewhere along the way, um, it turned from looking for stuff, for something, for an answer to life or to uh, a longing in myself, uh, to gratitude for finding something as precious as this. Um, that doesn't happen often. It's happened twice in my life. I wasn't going to let it unhappen a third time. Mm -hmm. um, so here I am in 100% uh, uh, just grateful um, to be able to uh, continue this way for myself, but also then uh, to share it with my family, with those I love and um, those I'm not so familiar with yet. I'd just like to say that uh, Token, uh, he uh, holds the position of work leader here, and uh, it's quite a demanding position. There's no sitting around and contemplating the redwoods all day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard work, and he has to be aware of people and machinery and everything that's happening on the land and trying to keep everything together in the practice here. And it's pretty demanding. Um, his background in uh, gardening and landscape has made him a wonderful person. I'm one of the land stewards here and I come up on Fridays. And it's a joy to work for him because he is a part of the land here. He understands the land. He's been up here for a long time. He enjoys the history, he knows plants, he knows animals, and uh, it's, uh, he kind of completes the package here. All right, let's, um, and let, if there's anything else that I can answer, let's get started in our, the main part of our talk here. Um, so I'd like to start with a, a, a poem uh, by a, a fellow, Khalil Gibran, uh, who's of Lebanese descent. Uh, he wrote a book in the early, early part of the 20th century, I believe, uh, named the, uh, called The Prophet. Um, it's of no particular tradition he comes from, just uh, ancient wisdom. It goes something like this. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks back at the path she has traveled 
from the peaks of the mountains, the long winding road crossing forest and village. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter, there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no other way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear because that's where the river will know. It's not about disappearing into the ocean, but becoming the ocean. For my talk, uh, I'm uh, gonna talk us through a bit of history. Uh, one of our lineage holding Soto Zen ancestors in particular, Tozan Ryokai, <clears throat> whose name is in Chinese, Dongshan Longji. I believe uh, my pronunciation is not that great in Chinese yet. Uh, so Tozan means a mountain cave, and he was born in the year 807 in Kwaiji, uh, China, which is about four or 500 miles south of uh, modern day Shanghai, uh, mountainous area. Uh, he started studying Buddhism at a young age, uh, a common custom uh, at that time in China. And by 10, he had moved away already from home and into a nearby mountain monastery. Here, he undertook his first steps in uh, ordination as a novice monk, a sramana. And uh, this is similar uh, to our lay ordination here in Soto Zen uh, that we call Jukai, which means uh, receiving the precepts. Now, uh, Zen Center will have a Jukai ceremony, uh, the first one under our a new abbot, uh, recently installed last year, um, later this year, uh, for various members of our Zen Center. And during that ceremony, you would recite and receive uh, Bodhidharma's One Mind uh, precepts before receiving uh, your Buddhist name and uh, a Raksu. Uh, the Raksu is this uh, cloth um, fabric uh, that we wear around uh, our necks, um, a symbol of uh, the Buddha's robes. Uh, now, just to give you a taste of uh, what these precepts are uh, and how they are a bit different, uh, substantially different than, uh, although they sound like they might be uh, similar to the Ten Commandments of Christianity, um, they are more about uh, how to live a more wholesome and fulfilling life of choice, uh, not so much of uh, judgmentalism of uh, what we think of it, or what I thought of in the past as uh, the commandments of the Bible. So uh, self nature is inconceivably wondrous. And in the Dharma of oneness, not raising a distinction between Buddhas and beings is called not slandering the three treasures. Self nature is inconceivably wondrous. In the Dharma of equality, not talking about self and others is called not elevating oneself and putting down others. Self-nature is inconceivably wondrous, and in the inexplicable dharma, not expounding a word is called not lying. Uh, we, by the way, uh, reconnect with these uh, precepts. There's more of them. Like I said, there's 10 of them. I'm only doing a little sampling. Uh, but we reconnect with these precepts uh, monthly at our Fusatsu ceremony, uh, which is an atonement ceremony that we conduct uh, at the full moon uh, every month in case... Uh, you're interested in looking into that some more. Uh, so uh, Tozan then at 21 years old, he traveled uh, from his home uh, region uh, to the Shaolin Monastery, which you probably most of you may have uh, heard one way or another through Kung Fu or Buddhism. But the uh, Shaolin Monastery uh, is where Bodhidharma, our, our first patriarch of uh, Chinese Zen, did his uh, well-known nine-year wall gazing practice uh, on Mount Song, um, far to the east. This is a monastery far to the east uh, of Shanghai. So Tozan uh, took full ordination as a bhikkhu uh, there uh, at the Shaolin Monastery. And in, today in Soto Zen, uh, this is comparable, taking full ordination is Tokudo ordination, uh, which is what I uh, undertook uh, last September uh, to receive these robes. In uh, Tokudo ordination, we commit ourselves to, <clears throat> to fulfilling the Bodhisattva vows. 
the Bodhisattva vows is something that uh, we recite uh, every day here at the Zen Center. Um, at the end of our sittings in the morning and in the evenings. So it's never far from us. Uh, I'll just go over uh, them for those who may not be as familiar as those of us uh, who sit here regularly. Uh, so sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Uh, desires are inexhaustible and I vow to put an end to them. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them. The Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. Uh, these, um, these vows are seemingly unattainable. In fact, that's what it says so right there in the vows. You know, inexhaustible, unattainable. Uh, but every once in a while, um, some sense of understanding may bubble up. Uh, they did, does for me. Uh, what am I actually saying here? What, what am I actually going to do about these things? Every once in a while, uh, some understanding will bubble up and uh, maybe something like uh, to befriend all is to save all, to love all is to save all, uh, to live in harmony with all is uh, mastering the dharmas. could be almost anything. And it really, uh, these aren't answers or solutions to the koan. Um, of what the, these vows are, um, but they are, uh, these answers are nothing more than uh, a gateway to further our relationship with these vows, with our commitments. Um, and that's a very uh, wonderful practice, a wonderful way to continue endlessly refining our lives to be more useful in this world uh, to ourselves, to our loved ones, to humanity. So uh, Tozan then spent also a large portion of his early life uh, wandering back in the day uh, to other uh, Zen masters and uh, mountain hermits. Uh, that was a pretty common practice uh, to mix and match the traditions. They were uh, fairly close in some ways and uh, but also unique in other ways. Um, I think that's one of the things that uh, I experienced uh, all those years ago when I was here at the Zen Center that left a big impression uh, was a rather um, eclectic stream of other traditions that would come and go through the Zen Center here uh, that informed Roshi's practice and teachings and wisdom. Uh, some of those uh, teachers uh, were like uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, Koban Chino, Odegawa Roshi, Dai San Sanim, who is a well-known Korean Zen master, Maha Gosananda, um, was a patriarch uh, from the Theravada tradition, very different, much older um, than our Soto Zen tradition. Uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, we also, on the property here, we have a, a stupa in his dedication. He died uh, sometime back in the 90s. Uh, but we were, the Zen Center here, were the first in the country to uh, erect a stupa in his honor um, as a memorial to him. And it's on the lower part of the property. We also have a, a stupa memorial for Suzuki Roshi, uh, for those who are, may not be familiar with the Zen Center. Um, now in uh, 859, at the age of 52, our Tozan Ryokai started his own school. He went off and um, created his own branch of uh, Buddhism that was around in China at the time, uh, moving far south of uh, his home region area. Um, and he had with him maybe 500, 1,000 disciples, something like that. This school came to be known as the Shaodong School in China. And this is the start of the lineage of great Soto Zen teachers uh, who hold that mind only is the Buddha and the practice of Shikantaza at its primary tenets. Uh, Tendo Nyojo uh, was uh, one of these uh, uh, descendants of uh, Tozan Ryokai, who went on to um, transmit the Dharma to uh, Ehei Dogen, who is uh, the founder of our particular Soto Zen uh, 
uh, from Japan. So Eihei Dogen, our founder, uh, was uh, went to China for some years, uh, traveling around China, uh, experiencing the Dharma there and visiting many uh, Zen masters at the time, uh, before returning to uh, Japan and starting uh, his own monastery uh, and uh, Soto School, which is what our tradition uh, is today. So uh, that's a, a very important distinction or uh, quality characteristic of uh, Buddhism in general, um, but it's particularly strong uh, vein in, in our school is the process of transmission of the Dharma, the teaching um, from teacher to student. So uh, our abbot, Nyose, I think is the 92nd um, inheritor of the Dharma teaching. Uh, he can trace that Dharma, the teaching person by person by person, all the way back 2,500 years to the day uh, Bodhidharma recognized Mahakashapa um, as uh, his uh, heir of the Dharma. And uh, that's a very powerful medicine. Uh, and uh, ah. gives us a very uh, wonderful uh, support uh, in wanting to continue that tradition and, and extend, opening ourselves uh, to be ever more helpful and useful in this world, this life. Um, so shikantaza, that may not be something that many of you know, uh, that word. Uh, we usually refer to our sitting practice as zazen, uh, which it is. But shikantaza is a particular style of sitting that we uh, uh, pursue, we undertake. And uh, our style uh, is also known as a silent illumination. And this was uh, established by one of um, uh, Tozan's, uh, also one of his descendants uh, back in China before Ehe Dogen. Uh, so uh, the Shikantaza, silent illumination, uh, Shikantaza means basically hit sit. Uh, and I, like I mentioned, it's really, uh, a principle, the principal uh, activity uh, that we, you know, center our lives around because it's so basic uh, to our humanity um, to visit that uh, spacious stillness and silence um, before we are uh, able to build our confidence and come back out into the world and, and, and share uh, some new way of being. Um, Shikantaza is both the actualization and uh, the transformation uh, of our Buddha nature and the Buddha Dharma. Uh, they're not separate. It's like uh, uh, looking at a mirror, form and reflection behold each other. So they're mirror images of each other. It's not one or the other, or uh, one's more original than the other. Um, they don't exist without each other. Uh, and from this, there's an expression uh, an attitude of tenderness that's developed, a selfless acceptance of suchness beyond doubt. Uh, this is what I think I was uh, responding to all those years ago and have come to appreciate just ever more uh, deeply since. Uh, in Japanese, this suchness beyond doubt is known as inmo. Uh, you could also call it uh, as it isness. It's very simple, actually. It's, all, it's so simple. But to be simple is not so easy. Uh, I'd like to pretty much wrap up uh, the talk, uh, except to add um, one of the sutras that uh, Tozan Ryokai um, is uh, credited with uh, um, creating. Uh, sutras is, is, is a, basically a teaching. Uh, it may have been orally transmitted back in the day, but then uh, at some point it got written down. 
this uh, sutra that he's uh, responsible for is, is known as the Hokyo Zanmai in Japanese and the Jewel Mirror Samadhi uh, Sutra in English. Uh, it's a sutra that many of us are not that familiar with because we don't really chant it. We don't use it, apply it here in the Zendo very often. Uh, but it is uh, it's something that we recite uh, almost on a daily basis um, during our regular residential practice here at the Zen Center. Uh, we uh, use it uh, during our uh, service, midday service before uh, lunch after we've uh, had our morning work period. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'll actually just pick out a little section of it. Um, it's not that long, um, but I've also made copies of it available uh, outside of the Zendo so you can pick up a copy and uh, uh, peruse it at your discretion um, afterwards. <clears throat> a wondrously embraced within the complete, drumming and singing begin together, penetrate the source and travel the pathways embrace the territory and treasure the roads you would do well to respect this do not neglect it natural and wondrous it is not a matter of delusion or enlightenment within causes and conditions time and season it is serene and illuminating so minute it enters where there is no gap so vast it transcends dimension a hair's breadth deviation and you are out of tune now there are sudden and gradual in which teachings and approaches arise. With teachings and approaches distinguished, each has its standard. Whether teachings and approaches are mastered or not, reality constantly flows. Outside still and inside trembling. I uh, wanted to stop at that right there um, because that kind of mirrors uh, the opening poem of Khalil's uh, speaking of the fear of the river entering the ocean. So it's actually this trembling. Liberation is not for those without trembling. So again, uh, I'll open it up to uh, conversation, questions, clarifications, or we can uh, go on to our lunch. Yes, Craig. Um, the origin of the precepts that you referenced. Okay. At what point did those begin to be standard? Was the standard? I, to be honest, I don't know uh, when that when the form of those precepts. The precepts go all the way back, though, to the time of the Buddha. Uh, but uh, in this version, we call them. They're known as the One Mind precepts of Bodhidharma. Uh, Bodhidharma is like the 27th, I believe, or eighth uh, uh, descendant from the Buddha. Um, so at some point they got uh, uh, interpreted for the Chinese and, and, and then uh, into Japanese. And now we have it in English. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a Sanskrit person or even a Chinese language person. So I don't know how uh, well they... Uh, or in what ways that they relate to the original things, or even when uh, our version had, had come to be. But uh, it must be at least, you know, these several hundred years old. Bodhidharma uh, came to China uh, around the sixth century, I believe, fifth, sixth century. Um, so we're talking, you know, 1500 years ago, something like that, uh, that they got probably translated into Chinese. But exactly when this version, uh, I don't, I'm not certain. But uh, there, it's a, uh, you know, they're just so beautiful words. They, you know, they're uh, so uh, uh, full of vision and, uh, you know, so lyrical and poetic. Uh, they can't help but, you know, touch something deep in us and tenderize us a little bit. Um, so. They're, uh, they're readily available online. You can Google you know, Bodhidharma's 10 precepts and you'll, you'll come up with the same version as what I'm looking at here. Thank you. Yes, Rika. So I, I can ask you about what is your motivation to keep practicing every day in the temple? It is not easy and very physically hard work and it's not 
one day and also living from your family. So that is different from living with your family and practicing Buddhism uh, yeah, in here and or yeah. uh, at your home. Yeah, you know, uh, being, uh, being here, I still get to, uh, you know, I live next door, <laughs> literally five minute walk down the road. Yeah. So I, I visit on a regular basis. I was there yesterday. Yeah. Uh, my, <laughs> so I didn't leave home very far. That should help. Yeah. Uh, my kids are they're in they're in their mid twenties and they've got their own lives uh, out in the world. So you know it wasn't until then that you know uh, uh, you know I I was in the right place to even be able to consider that kind of a thing. And like I mentioned earlier on, you know, my wife has been very understanding, gracious. Uh, she knew this was coming at some point. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that 20 was well, actually 28 years of marriage now. Um, uh, she's happy to, to loan me to the Zen Center, uh, you know, and take a pause herself you know, on vacation. Um, but the motivation for me to practice here daily, uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, and it has evolved, changed, transformed over all these years. You know, when I first got here, I knew nothing of what I was getting myself into, which, you know, might have been a good thing, beginner's mind, Zen mind. Um, and, you know, in those days, uh, I pretty much, you know, would, uh, would do what I was told, largely because I was innocent enough or whatever to um, feel like, uh, you know, there was something worthwhile at the end of the road there. Um, somewhere along the way, um, I gained a certain confidence in what I was living, uh, and that this was, uh, you know, good for me, good for life, uh, authentic. And, uh, so then that there was a change where there was much more of a sense of gratitude than there was of, you know, seeking something outside and that this was actually the best way for me to express something that was so important for me to, uh, you know, that meant as much as my family to me or, you know, my love for life. So it's no longer something that I get up at, you know, four or five in the morning and, uh, you know, scurry to, you know, make uh, Zazen in the morning. This is what I want to do. Uh, so embracing it, you know, at some point it became obvious for me. It was no longer something outside. Uh, you know, you don't have this opportunity when I, all those 25 years, even, you know, at home, you know, sitting wasn't, uh, uh, my wife, she's very diligent about all that kind of stuff. Uh, I wasn't so diligent about, you know, daily practice, but, um, uh, you know, the, the support uh, and the, you know, working together, being together, practicing together, uh, there's no substitute for it. Um, it's just very empowering. Uh, so even when you have doubts about what you're doing and why, uh, then, you know, you show up uh, or you don't, but, uh, you know, uh, eventually if you give yourself the time, uh, you know, it, it rings true for yourself. Um, and that's what's happened to me. And there's no other way, especially with, uh, you know, kind of the chaos out in the world. I'm, <laughs> You know, uh, the political realm, the financial realm, the, you know, wars uh, around the world. Again, I was in the military. I saw some of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, saber rattling back in the day. This was the Cold War, so it wasn't the 20 years war, war on terror. But uh, it was terrifying enough in its own way uh, that this is, uh, you know, I'm much, I'm just very grateful to have found another way to be. And uh, so it's not it's not complicated uh, for me, but uh, yeah. But it took me a while to you know I, I zigzagged you know I was in India and then I was looking for something in Catholic tradition. They wouldn't accept me as a monk because I wasn't born and raised and baptized the Catholic. So you know they they wouldn't let me in the door kind of thing. So uh, I just happened like I said fortuitously. Um, serendipitously, Joan Halifax, and uh, you know, coming here. So, what kind of moment do you feel most that gratitude? Well, that I uh, that I found Roshi. 
uh, you know, that he's been such a consistent uh, presence and such an authentic presence in his own life, the way he cares for uh, all of us, for him, for life. It's not, it's not me, it's not us even, it's, it's life. And uh, something in the uh, very considerate way that he goes about um, dealing with, uh, you know, the conditions of our uh, ephemeral life uh, just uh, resonated, is, you know, speaks to me very deeply. And it's like, I want to be something, you know, I want to be able to have that kind of power or, you know, presence. And uh, I know <clears throat> that without living in this kind of a community situation, the further away I get from the community situation, the easier it is for me to get distracted. And uh, so again, the, the, the robes, uh, the Sangha, all of you familiar, not familiar people, uh, are all great inspiration for me, that help remind me of where I wanna go. Um, so it's it, at some point uh, when you're able to um, take that in, it's no longer a job or a chore to be in the practice. Okay, uh, lunchtime. Thank you. Yeah.